Hey everybody, I'm Kevin Sambita. I'm the publisher and owner of Palladium Books. Um, our most, uh, probably most famous games are uh, Rifts, Heroes Unlimited, Palladium Fantasy, Beyond the Supernatural. And we did some big licensed games back in the uh, 80s and 90s and even more recently, including uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the role-playing game and uh, Robotech. I'm uh, here to talk about world building because world building is something that you need to understand if you're um, looking to create a new game or a new game world, a new game setting. Um, and it's also important when you're creating adventures for your game if you're a game master. So I thought it'd be a, a good subject. I'm obviously here alone myself uh, at my office at Palladium Books. Uh, if I start to sweat, it's because, uh, not that I'm nervous, it's because our air conditioning is out. And running the fan is just too darn loud. It creates a background buzz. So what I did is I, I asked people for uh, questions that they would like to hear answered. Uh, about world building, and uh, so you may see me pick up a piece of paper from time to time um, to read some questions. So the one question is, uh, who am I? And I already said, you know, I'm the owner, publisher of Palladium Books, but I'm also the main game designer and writer. Um, I've created something like a dozen different worlds uh, for role-playing games, pen and paper role-playing games, and uh, I have written or co-written more than 200 source books. So I've got a little bit of experience in this area. And of course, I've been role-playing for something like 45 years. So, uh, yeah. Um, the first question I have is, how did I get involved in world-building? And really, I, I kind of got into it out of necessity. I was playing uh, the original D&D. And this is not to slam D&D &D because D&D &D is the godfather of role-playing. It's what got all of us involved. D&D is great. I've known plenty of people who have run marvelous campaigns. Eric Widjik ran a D&D &D campaign, campaign for 27 years with the same group. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, but as I was playing D&D, &D, for me, in, in the original, you know, we're talking a little two pamphlets and a in a box, a little box, um, there just wasn't enough there. I love the idea of role-playing. I love the idea that you're creating characters and together, if you're part of the group, we, the Game Master, and the players are creating this story. And yes, there's an outline for a world, and yes, you may even have a canned adventure, but it's just this amazing, wonderful thing to me that a group of people get together to create what, when you're done and you're remembering it or you're recounting it to a friend, it's got the same power and feel of, it, of having read a wonderful book or a movie you just saw. But the cool thing about it is you are one of the main characters. You contributed to that story. Uh, your words, your actions, you know, good and bad, helped shape that story. Um, and I just thought there was nothing, nothing like that. And uh, I fell in love with role playing um, once I had a great experience with it. And uh, you know, so so that's how I got in, in, into world building and, and role playing. I, I I'm playing D and D, and it's just I'm big into story. I'm big into character. And there just wasn't enough there. So um, Eric Woodjake, myself, Matt Ballant, and several other people had started the Detroit Gaming Center. So we had a lot of different games going on on a regular basis. We had people showing up all the time. It was like a mini-con uh, every weekend. It was amazing. Uh, we'd have 100 to 300 people show up every weekend. So the cool thing about that is we got to see lots of different styles of gaming. We got to see every new game or source book that came out because inevitably somebody would bring it to the Detroit Gaming Center. And for me, the worlds weren't rich enough. And I also wanted to just create my own 
material. So I, I did that, and and very quickly, um, with D and D as my base, I set up this whole whole world, and my my game was very popular. I, I had in very short order. I had twenty six regular players every Saturday night. Now bear in mind, we're all in, in our teens or, or 20s, we're all pretty much college age. And uh, a game session typically went from uh, 7 or 8 in the evening till 8 or 9 in the morning. So, uh, you know, we got, a lot of, we got a lot of gaming in and it was a lot of fun. And having to run 26 people really uh, put me through my paces and really taught me early on that I needed to have good, strong stories, good pacing. I needed to do things to keep people interested all the time. But the other thing that really struck me was I wanted to have a very compelling um, setting. And while Dungeons & Dragons was my base, I quickly started to go beyond that and create a lot of different things. Uh, and a lot of that was out of necessity. Uh, for example, when we tried running D&D's psionic combat, um, it was just so slow and, and so funky that the two guys locked in Mortal Kombat turned to me, the two players, and said, just please end this. <laughs> you know, if you have to kill us to do it, do it. So I started to fill in what I felt were holes and plausibility. One of my problems with in the early days of gaming is, is it was a lot like the early video games where you just followed this trail and a lot of it didn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you're in a dungeon, you kicked in a door, you, 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 you screamed, you shouted, you cast lightning bolts and fireballs and killed whatever monster or, or bad guys are in it, you looted the place, you left the room and went to the door, right next door, and whoever, whatever was inside that, apparently didn't hear any of that, uh, <laughs> you know, it didn't matter how big the combat was, how noisy it was, you just, you know, you opened the door, went in, you dealt with them, you closed it, went on to the next door, and while that was kind of good, it's great for beginners. It made no sense to me, and I started to create this this very, very rich world, which gets to one of the questions um, that, that I've been asked here, which is, um, you know, how, how uh, what, what actually led to the game design aspect of uh, my career in, in creating role-playing games. So what happened is my, my, my guys were loving my game so much that after two or three years of, of playing, they said, geez, Kev, you know, your game is not D&D &D anymore. It's, you, you, you've made all kinds of house rules. You've tweaked all kinds of things. Um, you should release this as your own game. And uh, I, I like that idea. So I sat down and started hammering out uh, new sets of rules, character creation, that kind of thing. Um, I got input from guys like Eric Wojcik and, uh, of course, my players. And uh, I went to shop it around uh, after I had created the game. And I pretty much approached every game company that is that was out there at the time. We're talking 1981, uh, 1980. And... Uh, the best deal I could get was from a company called Judges Guild, which was uh, best known for producing Dungeons & Dragon uh, supplements and adventure books, uh, as well as Traveler and some other things. And uh, they offered me $500 and a 2% royalty that would slide down to a 1% royalty after we sold, or they sold, 10,000 copies. Well, that was ludicrous to me. I mean, it was just, you know, chump change, and I wasn't going to give my game away. Um, so I decided, you know, not for me. My, my original career plans were to become a comic book artist and writer, and I had been working towards that goal for a number of years. It was getting close. And then my group said, well, Kev, you've had experience doing um, publishing. You, you published some fanzines and a, and a comic book. Um, 
why don't you publish it yourself? And I thought about it, and I'm like, no. I mean, I just couldn't get, I couldn't get the idea out of my head once they implanted it. So that gave me the opportunity to spend time really thinking about games and game design. And again, because of the gaming center, I got to see all these different approaches and styles of, of playing. So I was able, in, in all the new books that came in, so I just looked at books like crazy, uh, role-playing games, and role-playing game, you know, the books of every kind, uh, and really started to tear it apart and, and analyze it and figure out how games worked, what made things tick, more importantly, what it was that players wanted. Um, because for me, any game design, whether it's a computer game, whether it's a role-playing game, um, a board game, miniature game, it's got to be fun. The players have to be having a good time. If your audience isn't having fun, then why are they going to play your game? Um, so that, that, that was really important. And, and so I started to really try to observe what my players enjoyed doing, what they really wanted in a game, uh, the things that got them most excited, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And I kind of filed it all away. Of course, I made copious notes and uh, went on to, to try to do my, my, my own games. Um, and, and the only reason that my, my very first release for Palladium Books wasn't Palladium Fantasy is I had this, this very clear idea of what I wanted the book to be. Um, and I wanted it to be a book. Uh, at the time, most role-playing games were either packaged in a box with dice, um, cheap dice, um, or they were being released as a hardcover. Well, I grew up poor in Detroit. I, I, I didn't have the money to make a uh, hardcover or a box game. So I went with what I knew, and I released a small game um, that was science fiction called The Mechanoid Invasion. It was a three-part fun kind of sci-fi saga while I was figuring out ways to make money to release Palladium Fantasy as a large, uh, you know, 250 plus page standalone role-playing game. Um, and that's what really set off my company. That's where, where things really, really took off. Um, but the principles of world building really apply to any kind of game setting that, that you're making, especially for role-playing games or, or computer games, where you have, especially nowadays, very rich characters, a uh, very rich dynamic setting, um, strong visuals. So all of that is, is part of things you have to keep in mind when you're trying to develop stuff, especially for publication. Um, so uh, that's what kind of got me into role-playing. I'm going to go into some specific questions that, that people have asked me. So what do, you get, what, do you, what do I do as a game designer to get into the mood? Several people actually asked me that question. Um, so I'm one of these lucky people who where everything gives me ideas. Uh, I'll, I'll see a cool visual in a commercial and I'll think, oh, how can I apply that to a game? Or I'll read something, um, or I'll see something in a movie or TV. And obviously, I get all kinds of inspiration from those kind of sources. Books, movies, television, uh, comic books, novels, history, um, wildlife. Uh, I, I, I'm... I'm kind of into animals and, and understand animals. I've had to also for research purposes uh, for my games. So uh, everything kind of gives me uh, an idea for role-playing and kind of gets my juices flowing so I get in the mood. But when I really need to get into the mood to write something, I like talking to people. I like bouncing ideas off other gamers. Um, and, and see what they like. And inevitably, if I talk about, oh, we got this, or I'm thinking about that, they're going to say, well, hey, have you thought about this? Or have you considered doing, you know, whatever? Um, and so it's good to get 
get that kind of feedback. Uh, and for me, even just talking about my ideas get um, more ideas flowing. And, and I kind of want to talk about that because, uh, to me, the real essentials of creating, whether it's a whole world or whether it's a, a villain or a monster or a demon or, or, or whatever it might be, it's about taking that basic idea and then asking yourself questions about it. Um, here's a great example. I, I had a freelance writer come up with a creature. Um, they had a lot of really cool things. But one of my problems with it is, is it just felt cobbled together without any real thought. And I, have, I had this conversation with him, so I know he won't mind me sharing it. Because he was just kind of wowed by it. And to me, it was like very basic stuff. So he was calling it um, an, an arachnopod. Which to me, an arachno or arachnid, that's a spider. So this is going to be some kind of spider-like creature. The problem I had is, as I'm starting to read this um, description, is that it's a plant. It's sort of a rooted plant-like creature. It sort of has these appendages that are reminiscent to a spider, but it's not really uh, a spider. And then the thing also had tentacles, and to me, these, these don't make sense anymore. So, because when you, for example, when you're creating a creature, if it's an arachnid, it's got to be spider-like or, or, or um, scorpion-like, which means it's got to have eight legs. Um, if it's an arachnid, it's going to follow certain kind of behavioral patterns. It lay, lays eggs. Uh, it can probably climb walls um, and ceilings. These are all important things that are just common to all arachnids. Uh, so that should be part of this creature if we're going to call it an arachnopod. So where do tentacles come in? And yeah, you can have tentacles and it can make sense. But most creatures that have tentacles... Are aquatic. In fact, off the top of my head, I can't think of any real life creature that lives on the surface that has tentacles. Um, so clearly, this is not an aquatic creature because it's a it's a plant, and it's not an aquatic plant. Um, so all these things start to just really clash for me. And so what I do in a situation like that, whether it's someone else's creature that I'm retooling and making work uh, better, or whether I'm creating it myself and I've got these ideas, I start to try to think about what makes sense, how do these things work together, um, if it does have tentacles, you know, why? And, and not just some cheap answer like, well, it's a supernatural creature, so that's fine. Uh, it can have anything. Because it, it doesn't really make sense. And so once you start to think about what it is, so let's say we went with keeping this an arachnoid, then it's a predator, and that's a, there's a big difference between a predator and a herbivore and you know different types of creatures. A, pr a predator is going to be much more aggressive. Uh, it might be an ambush predator. Uh, you know, can it run? Does it jump? Does it hide and leap out of the shadows or from the ceiling? All, as you can see by asking these kind of questions, what does it do? How does it function? When you start thinking of what the answers are, it starts to shape your creature. And I wanted to use a creature as an example because I think it's something everyone can relate to or world building starts to get bigger. But the basic principles are the same. So if you're trying to develop a particular new species of humanoid um, or some kind of monster, all these same principles apply. And I start asking myself things like, you know, why does it act like this? You know, where does it live? How does it, you know, who, what, when, where, how, all those kind of questions 
apply. And then on top of that, and this is true of world building and, and character creation, um, I, I then think in sort of the game context of to make this cool idea work, to make this cool character or this cool setting work, what are the game mechanics behind it? How do I have to um, figure out what rules need to be tweaked or added or how does this blend in? How do what, what and then sometimes there's logic questions. So if I'm going to do this and if it has that, then again, those questions are coming in. Then how does it function or why can't these people detect it or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and it just really, for me, it really just starts to feed on things. And then sometimes as the ideas come, as I'm developing, say, a particular civilization or race of people, um, I start to think, well, there's got to be some kind of uh, antagonist, some kind of conflict. So what is that? And why would someone be opposed to their lifestyle? Or maybe it's the geography. Maybe they live in a fertile land or, you know, where there's gold buried or all kinds of things. And that starts to create the basic foundation for perhaps your geopolitical elements. Um, you, you know, in, in rifts, for example, you, you've got this huge clash between magic users and creatures of magic who, who obviously use magic and tend to be more free thinkers, and the coalition states. And the coalition states are these very high-tech oriented people who use uh, science and technology and power armor and bionics, robotics, all that stuff. And uh, so when they look at someone who can create something or conjure something out of thin air, not only does it scare them, but it seems unnatural. And so for them, magic has been blacklisted and anyone who practices magic is dangerous um, and needs to be dealt with. And unfortunately their way of dealing with people is, uh, you know, to kill them or, you know, force them to move far away, even as the coalition itself expands um, into more and more territories. And because they tend to have the technological edge forcing the indigenous people, the people who have taken up uh, their their uh, habitation in, in a particular area, you know, they're now being forced out by the coalition or, you know, what we call DBs, which are dimensional beings, uh, humanoid aliens who come from uh, another world through the rifts, and the rifts are tears in space and time. And all of that came out of ideas when I was first starting rifts, that just kind of rose out of, I had all these ideas of what I wanted to do. And, and, and the chief idea behind Rifts, because um, it's a great example of world building, was I wanted to have a setting where magic and technology could coexist and basically be equals. But I also wanted a setting where the players could pretty much engage in any type of adventure they wanted to do and I wanted to have all these different settings that were available to the players you know in the same world in the same environment and so one of my big challenges for, for Rifts was how do I make sense of that how can I have you know this high-tech society here and these magic users there and these aliens here and these other aliens here and these cowboy-like you know civilization here where, where, where they're still you know known as the Pecos Raiders and they, they rob people and they're, they're sort of a bandit culture and all this stuff and I had all these you know different ideas plus I wanted to incorporate horror elements and uh, supernatural and post-apocalyptic and that's where it was the post-apocalyptic part that helped the puzzle pieces because I had all these ideas fragmented ideas and it was when I hit upon post-apocalyptic that the puzzle pieces started to fit so what I did is I said okay here's earth after not just one cataclysmic uh, event that ultimately would reshape the world but it was followed by a 200-year dark dark age where a lot of people 
lost technology. Um, so our own culture devolved into a more primitive state, while those who happened to luck into technology or were able to hang on to technology in little pockets still held on to things, and they had certain advantages. But then I really jumbled things up even more by saying, okay, well, during the Great Cataclysm, rifts opened up the lines of energy. So there's a theory um, for people who believe in, in uh, geomancy and, and earth energies, which I love, that there are lines of energy throughout our planet. And the Chinese have, have believed in what they call dragon lines forever. And these are these, these power lines of earth energy. Um, and in many cases, it, it's magic because where two or more of these lines cross, they tend to create mythologically in our own real earth myth, they, they tend to uh, create places of power, uh, places of mystical or spiritual or supernatural events. Stonehenge is a great example of that. Um, other places where miracles are reported or ghosts are seen all the time um, or strange phenomenon. Um, I took the concept of, of these ley lines being magic energy and, and actually I can't take credit for the original concept. It was Randy McCall who wrote the first edition of Beyond the Supernatural, who came up with this beautiful idea about how magic should work. And uh, I didn't feel he took it far enough when he turned into book, and I grabbed it and just went nuts with it. Um, so it's cool because you have these lines of energy that are just natural. So in Rifts, what happened is, is this cataclysm happened, and it caused a surge in the Rifts, and the Rifts just went crazy. So after tens of thousands of years where, where, where magic was just this tiny little trickle along these lines of energy, they, they exploded like a deluge, like a dam bursting. And all of a sudden they went from a trickle to a tidal wave. And as this tidal wave happened and spread across the planet, our entire planet, it caused more destruction, and the way I have things set up in rifts is all living things have potential psychic energy, or PPE. And at the moment of death, your PPE doubles. And in the case of a mass cataclysm, it gets sucked into these ley lines, which only gets them to flare up even more. And so you can see you had this huge domino effect, this big ripple effect. And when the Great Cataclysm had uh, happened, um, rifts, tears in space and time would open up to other worlds, other dimensions, and all kinds of different beings, some supernatural, some are dragons, some are elemental, some are gods and demons of our own mythology, uh, they reappeared on earth. Uh, and, and as the rifts uh, kept unleashing these things, um, you know, our civilization just totally collapsed. I mean, even those who survived got, you know, crushed by sometimes invading armies or, or, or you know, demon plagues uh, and all kinds of craziness, which is why I then put in the 200-year Dark Age because I said, okay, to myself, we need a time for this to settle down. And what I wanted is that we have Earth and we have a place that we all know or think we know and understand. But now, in the current Rift's timeline, there's all these little pockets where things settle down. So maybe here in Kentucky, our, our magic users and a small group of a particular DB that have started a village, um, or, or here in you know the West, uh, people have kind of adapted the old West kind of mentality. So you have cowboys and gunslingers, except you know they use TK weapons, as in telekinetic bursts, or they use uh, techno wizardry, which is a combination of magic and technology. So you could have a laser gun that's actually powered by magic, 
uh, by magic energy and, and by a magic spell. So while it has the effect of firing a laser, it's actually a product of magic, even though it's coming out of the barrel of a gun and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and that was the beauty of Rifts is I, I could now, because I kind of deconstructed the whole world, I could now rebuild it with all these cool little places. And so you could travel the equivalent of traveling from, you know, your home state to the next state, it could be as different as an alien world. And you have all these different people and different cultures and different um, types of magic or technology or, or customs. And um, it, for me, it was just this, this grand experiment and put everything I could in there and, and make it work. Um, and that goes back to my feeling that role-playing is just this amazing experience unlike anything else. Pen and paper role-playing games are limited only by your imagination um, and the creativity of, of yourself and your, your fellow players and your game master. And I wanted to create an environment where people could play anything. If you wanted a place in the world where you could basically play you know, magic detective noir, you could. If you wanted to play cowboys, um, you could. If you wanted to play uh, magic users, you could. If you wanted to be robots and cyborgs, you could. If you want to clash those together, and there's constant clashes because these horrible supernatural things show up, or dragons, or, you know, it's just, to me, it, it was sort of the, the penultimate uh, a role-playing experience. At least that's what I wanted to try to give people. Um, obviously that's a huge undertaking and I, I probably shouldn't have jumped into that as, as, as a great example uh, because uh, th there's a lot going on there. Um, but it's something I, I really wanted to do and it took me like three and a half years to, to make all those puzzle pieces uh, come together. Um, and besides that, that kind of broad idea, what really got me going for, for, for riffs was uh, this image, because you know my background is, is being an artist. Um, in fact, a bunch of the early books that Palladium produced, I was the artist, writer, <laughs> game designer, publisher, uh, unfortunately editor, because I can't spell worth crap, and uh, the poor mechanoid invasion, it's this little 48 page or 64 page book and, and it averaged 20 typos a page and that's not an exaggeration um, so uh, you know I had to bring in people who could help me and thank God for computers later with spell checks that's helped a lot and grammar checks uh, and of course the more you do it the better you get with everything so uh, that was cool but um, you know, it, it, it's just, for me, part of world building is really starting anywhere. Grab whatever idea you want and run with it. So one of the pivotal ideas for Rifts was the, what's now known today as the Glitter Boy. But it started out as this character that I called the Boomer. And, and Boomers were like these, these heroes and this powerful... Uh, chrome glistening, hence the name Glitter Boy, power armor. And they would plot along and they had this big ass weapon they'd pull out, this big gun that was the boom gun. And they were going to be like one of my central heroes in, in the game and, and they sort of still are. But I kind of mapped out in my mind what, what they would be. But as my ideas for the world grew larger and larger and larger, the Glitter Boy was playing a smaller, smaller, and smaller role. So, also at the same time, there was um, a, a Japanese animation that came out, an anime that came out called Bubblegum Crisis. And one of the kids was a science fiction setting, uh, Future Earth, with power armor and, and cyborgs. And the main bad guy was known as a boomer. And I didn't want people to think I was ripping off Bubblegum Crisis, even though our characters were, were, were quite different. Uh, and I didn't want confusion um, between the name and my game. 
because uh, Bubblegum Crisis was pretty popular at the time. But also the name just didn't really seem to fit anymore. So I continued to develop the world in, in different aspects. And uh, at some point when I, I, I had most of the, the game done and I had most of the, uh, the really hard stuff done, um, I realized I needed a new game and I was a uh, name. And, and I was very frustrated because I couldn't come up with anything. So I'm talking to my, my buddy, Eric Wojcik, uh, who was a great game designer. He's the guy who, um, with my outline, developed the uh, Teenage Mutant, Mutant Ninja Turtle and other strangeness role-playing game and the awesome animal creation rules that we still use to this day with Heroes Unlimited and in After the Bomb, uh, two other world settings. And, uh, you know, Eric says, well, d describe you know, your, your game for me in the world. And, and I'm telling them about this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, the rifts this and the rifts that. And you, know, you can travel through the rifts and things come out of the rifts. And <laughs> at some point, Eric goes, well, Kev, why don't you just call it Rift World? And, and I don't know, it didn't really sit with me. And at the time, there were a lot of, you know, there was Ring World and some other world. And I didn't really like it. And I said, I don't know. And he goes, well, well then you know, just call it riffs. And I'm like, nah, maybe. Uh, it's a good working title, we'll see. By the time the book was ready to go to the printer a year or so later, I couldn't imagine it being called anything but riffs. Um, and, and that's part of what's important with world building too, is listen, listen to other people. Um, you know, one of the, the questions is, uh, where do ideas come from? How do I get started? And I, I, I kind of talked about that. Um, your ideas can come from anywhere, and you can get started anywhere. Pick what you are excited about, and start there, and the rest will come. And, 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 and it's cool, because it really does start to form, uh, and uh, there's nothing like it. it it's it's just this great thing to just start with this speck of an idea and, you know, build on it and, and see where that idea takes it. I, I, I really like taking that kind of or organic approach. Uh, and then go with the excitement of those ideas. What I do often when I'm writing is uh, I just write to get the ideas down. I, I get to a point, I get into myself in sort of a state where... I, I don't even feel like I'm, I'm writing this stuff sometimes. I just I feel like, uh, I joke around and tell people, I, I feel like aliens are beaming this data into my head and all I'm doing is trying to, you know, get it down on the computer before the transmission stops. So I, I try to get all the ideas down and then um, I'll go back and make sure they work. You know, and sometimes you have to throw stuff out. There's been lots of times where, as I'm writing it, I'm thinking, wow, this is the greatest thing since, I don't know, Star Wars or Hemingway or, or something. It's a masterpiece. And then a couple days later, or, or even, even a month later, I, I get to that chunk and I'm like, yo, this is just terrible. Uh, or the germ of the idea is good, but the writing just blows. <laughs> and, and, and that's where, you know, the, the really hard work comes in because you got to go in and fine-tune it and make sure it works, make sure it, it, it fits with the rules and everything makes sense, that it fits with the world setting. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, go with the flow, trust your gut. Um, let's see, what's another question? Um... So, uh, what do you do to get into the mood to, to, to write? Uh, and I think I already, uh, I think we started to talk about that and I veered off. Um, like I said, I, I like talking to other people, bouncing off ideas and things. Um, but, you know, reading a book or a comic or, you know, something will just give me an idea. And I'm always making notes. I, I sometimes would dream stuff too. And so I always have a notepad. If I wake up in the middle of the night so I can jot down notes. Um, heck, there have been times when I'm driving home uh, 
and an idea hits me and I have to pull over to the side of the road so I can jot ideas down. And it's important to jot the ideas down because you will forget them. They, they come in a moment of inspiration. Um, and sometimes it's like a little lightning bolt. And then by the time you get home a half hour, hour later, and you walk through the door and you, your wife and kids and you know you hear all kinds of stuff and news and the next thing you know it's like what was that idea I know I had a great idea <laughs> where did it go um, so it's important to make notes uh, for yourself and jot down those ideas especially when they're when they're flowing hot um, so uh, and then another question is, uh, do you see yourself creating from a place of story, of telling stories or a place of building a world that others can tell stories in, or both? And, and I very much have to say both. Um, I, I really see them interconnected because, uh, you know, you're, you're creating that world uh, for people to play in. So, so it's important to keep them in mind as you're building that that world, um, you know. And, and then, based on what your world is, and, and it, when it kind of goes back and forth, so you probably have a great idea for a story or a conflict. So you build that into the world. So I mean, elements of the world, like sometimes geography, will play a role. Um, in what you find in, in that part of the world, the kind of creatures, maybe the kind of people, the kind of society, um, whether they're influenced by aliens or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and so that might spark a particular element of, of your world and you build it up from there. Other times you'll have a story uh, or, or a plot element, like, like a conflict or, or a bad guy or a monster um, that's going to threaten people in this corner of your world. Um, and then you kind of build elements of the world uh, around that. Um, that kind of ties into this next question, which is how important is it to map out the world you are creating before you start? And that's a really cool question. Um, I, I think you should have a basic idea of what your world is going to be and what your goals are for, for the adventures in this world, for, for the players, for your audience. Um, but I don't think you have to have every nook and cranny of your world figured out before you're, you're able to release it. And in fact, um, I, I think you want things to grow organically. You want to get feedback when you release your game or, or your next source book. You want to get feedback from your audience and, uh, you know, in this case, gamers. So you want to know what the gamers loved about it, what the gamers didn't like, that maybe you can you can adjust um, in, in an upcoming source book. Um, you know, what did they go gonzo over? So you can do more of that later. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it's definitely a blend of... of, of, of uh, of story and world and character. Um, is your word building driven by player characters or the nature of the world? And again, sort of like we were saying, it, it's a combination of both. Um, I, uh, you know, I think that that's really, really important. And that's what makes designing role playing games akin to rocket science. It, it, it is a lot to it, and that shouldn't dissuade you um, from, from diving in and doing it, and, and probably every single game master out there is doing it already without even thinking about it. Because when you create your your adventures for your players, and they come into this town, or these haunted woodlands, or whatever, you've already figured that stuff out. I, I mean, it's all, it's just a little smaller version of, of world building um, and that's all that world building is is all these little corners that make up a whole and while you have to have an overall idea of what your whole is so things don't you know ridiculously clash um, it's all about that the players and the characters for me role-playing games is all about character and story um, that's what that's what uh, drives everything 
Um, that's what it's all about. You're creating this world, and you're creating these bad guys and weapons and magic for players to play in your world. Um, and uh, you want them to be able to run off and, and take your ideas and, 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 and play in your sandbox, basically. Uh, you know, so uh, you try to give them the tools, the information, the characters, the powers, the villains that they can use to weave their own adventures, um, marvelous adventures that they'll remember for probably the rest of their lives. Uh, and again, that just gets down to the beauty of role playing. Um, it, it's it's a magical idea. Thank you, Gary Gygax. Um, so. Uh, um, let's see here, uh, sort of what ties in, oh, here, here's a good question, um, what, it, what do I do to wow my audience? Uh, and I just touched upon that a, a little bit, um, when I, when I design these games, they're not just for myself, I mean, obviously they, they come from, uh, my imagination and from my own interest. Um, and because I love role playing and I've been both a game master and a player, I, I know all the different sides uh, of the game. And so when I'm writing my, my games, I have my, my, my audience in mind all the time. Uh, not only that, I actually imagine particular players, you know, the guy who's the rules lawyer, the guy who breaks every rule, uh, the guy who tries to take it to the max. Um, you know, you try to think of, of, you know, the power gamer and the guy who wants puzzles and how do you weave all these different elements uh, into the game to kind of help keep everybody happy, give everybody a little something to do. Um, and so when I'm writing these games and coming up with whether it's an actual setting thing, or one of the villains, or the monsters, or the hero, or a new ability. I'm always thinking about whether me as a player, I mean I'm a role player, right? So I role play myself, I think of myself as, if I'm playing this game, what gets me excited? What's going to be the wow factor? Um, and if it gets me excited, it's likely to get the next guy excited. And again, I think about my audience and the different types of players um, and the kind of things that they like, uh, interwoven of things that I like. But ultimately, it's about the audience and their gaming experience and, and what I can do to give them a world that is just this marvelous playground where they can pull all kinds of adventures from all different kind of areas. Um, because that's what role-playing and, and the setting is all about. It, it lays the groundwork for others to come in and build their own adventures based on, you know, the swings and the teeter-totter and everything else that you have put in your playground for, for them to use. Um, let's see. How important are rules? Well, rules are super important. <laughs> I, I mean, they're... If you're building a car, the rules are your engine. They're, they're, they're what makes everything work. Without a solid set of rules, um, you don't have game balance. You don't have um, something to drive the game. So uh, you really do have to think about your rules and make sure when you introduce something new, and that's always tricky, that it doesn't imbalance the game, um, that it still makes sense, that it still is fun to play. Um, you know, that doesn't overpower anything, that you cover all the avenues. Uh, you know, one of the things I see all the time from, from freelancers, especially uh, inexperienced writers, is they'll have a cool idea. You know, they'll have a cool name, and they'll have this description, especially of spells and powers. So, here it is. And, and I read this thing, and I'm thinking, okay, that, that's cool. But they didn't go through the litany of questions, when, where, how, why. You know, they didn't think, you know, what other ways can I use this, this spell? Uh, how can I abuse this spell um, or power? And you need to ask yourself all these things because 
when you get the answer in your head, you have to then sit down and say, okay, how do I mitigate that? How do I prevent them from abusing the power level that this thing provides? Or is it too powerful? Does it need to get tossed? Um, you know, it, it's just a lot of question answering because every element of a role-playing game is part of the world and part of the building uh, of that world. You know, one of the projects that uh, uh, Matt, Matthew Clemens, uh, Mark Oberly, and I have been uh, fooling around with for several years now has been uh, the Rifts Laszlo source book, which I think is going to be a, a probably two, three different source books. Uh, on Laszlo. And Laszlo is a location in Rifts that is known for its enlightened population, um, their, their, their tolerance, and their uh, vast magical knowledge, which of course goes in direct conflict with uh, the coalition states. So they have this tenuous coexistence. And I think a lot of people think of Laszlo as a place where, man, if I want to learn 20 high-level spells, I go to Laszlo, spend a month there, pay somebody X amount of money, and I walk out with, you know, Earthquake and uh, Havoc and all these other, you know, powerful spells, open dimensional portal. And, uh, you know, it doesn't work that way. Um, for Magic Society to exist... Um, there have to be a lot of constraints, a lot of self-discipline, uh, a lot of things uh, behind that culture and civilization and the way they, they think and, and work and live every single day. And that's why the book has not come out in, in all these years, is because it's not a small project to make it really fit, to really make it work, to really make it balanced. And, and that's what we're trying to do right right now. Um, and I think we made some really great headway. I, I, I really love a lot of stuff that Matt did. I love a lot of stuff that uh, Mark Oberly is, is kind of wrapping up right now. Uh, we ha hope to have a, sort of a raw preview edition um, in August uh, for people who are into that uh, to see the work in progress. Um, but yeah, that was a big project when it came to world building. And again, that's an example of it's this little corner of the world. It's basically Toronto, Canada, um, and this, this society of mages um, and scholars that have set up sort of this kind of enlightened utopia, but you know, there's no such thing as a utopia. So there are issues, there are underlying currents, underlying problems and discord and um, so, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to, uh, just sit down and, and kick out. Um, and that kind of gets back to, you know, where do ideas come from and, and how do you develop them? You know, Laszlo is something, because I've had a lot of other projects, what, what I love to do, and what I have the, the luxury of doing, is I love to be able to sit down and think about a book. I mean, just think about a book for a month or two. Um, and work out a lot of stuff in my head and make a bunch of notes and, and, and suggestions and comments to myself and then start talking about it and get other people's feedback and, and make more notes and comments and things and then see, see where I'm going to take this. Um, but I haven't really had that luxury with, with Laszlo and it's such a pivotal community and culture within the Rifts Earth setting of North America, that it wasn't something I could just, you, you know, crank out and say, eh, you know, it's got to be balanced, it's got to make sense. The other thing, whenever I'm designing any place, and Laszlo is a great example of this, is what makes it unique? Again, we start getting into these questions. What makes it unique? Why, as a player, do I want to go there? Uh, what advantages does it have? What appeal does it have? Um, can I find, can my character find work there or learn new magic or go on magical missions or go to other worlds or, you know, can I purchase magic items that are found in nowhere else? 
Um, these are all kinds of questions. Um, when we were looking at Laszlo, another question was, um, do you know how prevalent is magic in, in Laszlo society? You know, I, I think a knee-jerk reaction is that everyone in Laszlo must cast magic. Really? Do they? Probably not. Um, you know, you probably have areas of magic, and, and uh, you know, you probably have, because you're thinking about a real life society like, like ours today, you're going to have magic that you use for travel and for safety and for all kinds of different things. Your average Laszlo citizen isn't going to know spells like lightning bolt or, or call lightning or fireball or any number of combat spells that your adventurers do. And, and then are they just going to teach anybody who comes to town and says, Hi, I, I, I want to learn these devastating spells. Uh, I want to learn how to uh, metamorphosis. You know, I, I want to be, change my, my appearance. Um, I want to be able to summon storms. Uh, I want to be able to uh, open the rifts. Uh, you know, this is not the kind of thing that you go, Hey, yeah, hey, buddy, for 10,000 10, credits or even 100,000 credits, I'll teach you whatever you want to know. Um, there may be some disreputable people in Laszlo who are willing to do that, but that's not going to be the average person. I, I, I almost picture parts of Laszlo like uh, the old John Carpenter movie, They Live, where there's all these subliminal messages, street signs and sayings and things, you know, and in this case, it's, uh, you know, use magic responsibly. Um, you know, think before you cast your spell. Uh, you know, it's, you know, w w with great power comes great responsibility. A and power, you know, knowledge is power and, and magic. That's pretty powerful. I mean, overtly, directly powerful, depending on the spell you have, that you can dominate another person or shrink them or grow yourself or you know, inflict them with agony, or blind them, or any number of things. Um, you know, if you're a society of practitioners of magic, these are really things that are important to you, and that you're not just going to teach and throw out in, in a very cavalier manner. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, do you see canon? Uh, as cast in stone or subject to continuous development? Um, a little bit of both. Uh, there are certain things, certain parts of canon that are definitely cast in stone. I, I'm a big believer in continuity. Uh, it's one of the things when I was a kid growing up with Marvel Comics uh, and I read everything I could lay my hands on. Um, I really liked the continuity and most of you guys do too. Um, you know, that's one of the big you know, complaints I hear about the new Star Wars movies is the continuity. Um, you know, heck, even midichlorians, I mean, that that blew my mind uh, because I loved the concept of anyone who had the heart and the courage and willing to put in the training could be a Jedi, and now it's if you had bugs, enough bugs in your blood, um, you could be a Jedi with the right training. I, I thought that was very disappointing. Uh, George, <laughs> you know, I uh, uh, I was very disappointed, disappointed and disillusioned by that. Um, so, uh, you know, you really have to give all these different elements thought, and you want to try to maintain a level of continuity that makes sense for your audience, because. You know, especially something like Rifts or Pladiant Fantasy, uh, most of our games, a lot, most of our games have been on the market for, you know, 20, 30 years or longer. So you have a generation or two who know your stuff, who love your stuff, who see it in a particular way, and if you mess with the continuity without the respect that your audience deserves, uh, or in a foolish or trite or, you know, stupid way, um, 
you're going to disappoint people, uh, and, and you don't want to do that. You want to keep your audience, you want to make them happy, or at least I do. I mean, I am always thrilled when people, you know, come up to me and tell me how awesome my games are, how much they love this character, or that spell, or this location in my world, because I'm creating it for them, um, as well as venting my own creative energies and, and, and doing things for myself. So, um, I think that that's important. I know one of the later questions I think I'll jump to now is, do I approach a licensed property any different than when I'm world building my own creations? And, and, and again, the answer is yes and no. So what I was just talking about with continuity and maintaining the canon that has already been set forth as best you can is when I when I took a property like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Robotech, my mission was to give the people the audience that already exists because of the comic book or, or when I did Turtles it was comic book, there was no TV show yet or movies. People who love the comic book, people who love the anime, in the case of Robotech, give them something they would recognize. Give them... I basically wanted to take those shows from the pages of the comics and from the anime and put it into a role-playing game and breathe life into it in a new medium, which is tough. Um, there's definitely challenges. Um, so, so your first job with a licensed property is to, to honor what's come before and, and to put that in some kind of game context that makes sense and is, again, fun for, for, for your audience so that they have a good experience. And then you have to think about ways to uh, expand upon what's there. Um, and to create that world. Because a lot of times there, there's cool characters, great ideas, but there's not necessarily a world behind it or, or a world that people will care about. You know, Conan the Barbarian is a great example. It, it, it's a tough one because, you know, who do you want to play? I want to play Conan. If I'm playing a character from the book, I want to play, play Conan, maybe Red Sonja. Um, after that, who? you know, some, some schmo, some sidekick. Nobody wants to play, I shouldn't say nobody, most people don't want to play the sidekick. They want to be a hero. And that's the beauty of role-playing games, is even in a group of 26 players, in my case, when I was running my fantasy game, every one of them was a hero. It was a cadre of heroes. Each one with their role, each one of their importance, uh, each one contributing to the story. Uh, and that's that's beautiful. Um, you know, nobody was a sidekick. So, I, you know, I've been offered worlds uh, in the past that I, I've declined, uh, like like Conan and like when when TSR did Indiana Jones, they had the same problem. It's our modern world. Actually, it's not even our modern world. It's our our, our world in the forties, nineteen forties and fifties maybe, and. Uh, you know, it's kind of pulp stories, and, and who are you going to play, indie or short round? I mean, you know, there's only so many characters you can play, and the world was not unique enough, in my opinion, to be vibrant. It was just too ordinary. I had the chance of getting Prince Valiant at one point, which, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Prince Valiant is a decades-long running comic strip that's appeared in newspapers uh, throughout the United States since the 1930s. It's pretty epic. The original creator, Hal Foster, was a magnificent artist, wonderful storyteller. And it's basically that this Prince Valiant is one of one of the Knights of the Round Table uh, that people don't really know. So he, you know, from time to time cavorts with King Arthur or Merlin, but mostly it's the stories of Val and his family, and it's a, it's a nice world, the artwork's magnificent, and the original art sells for gazillions of dollars when you can find it, and and I love it. I, I loved it as a kid, and, and in the late 80s or 90s, um, I was offered it and, and some Peter Falk, um, not Peter Falk, uh, that's an actor, um, uh, 
but the, the guy who created the Phantom and uh, Mandrake the Magician and some other really, really cool stuff. And I was so tempted to get it, especially if I had access to the Hal Foster archives of art. I mean, just personally, it was a dream come true. And Chaosium had tried to do something, I think it was Chaosium, had tried to do something with, with Prince Valiant uh, like 15 years earlier. Uh, it kind of fell flat. And as much as I personally love the, the IP, uh, I didn't think it was sufficient, none of them were sufficient, to turn into a role-playing game. Because you had like a central character, and the settings, getting back into settings and world buildings, is if you had a, a, the opportunity to play Dungeons and Dragons or Palladium Fantasy, which was much more out there, much more um, high fantasy, why did you want to play basically knights in shining armor fighting barbarians and, you know, very little magic? Uh, it was just very limiting. And, and, and again, if it, someone can, might come out and do a magnificent job, uh, if you have the right vision for it, uh, you can make anything magnificent, but I didn't have that vision, um, and, and I, I turned them down because I didn't feel like the opportunity for world building, the way it needed to be done, well, what was there. So, uh, you know, and that's a great example of when it comes to a license, you know, is it viable? Does it does it work for um, the world you want to build? Does it work for? Uh, your audience. Um, you know, we, we also turned it down uh, um, X-Files and, and Alien. For, for the longest time I wanted to do Alien versus Predator and we, we looked into it in, in the 90s and uh, we, we could have gotten both those licenses but the constraints on approval and what we could do and couldn't do were just so rigid and narrow that we passed. Um, even though we were on the verge of signing contracts, I just sat back and went, I, I can't do this. It's not going to be the game that I know my audience is going to expect. Uh, and if I can't give my audience what they expect, then it, it's not worth doing. Uh, and, and that basic concept works on, on any type of world building, whatever you're, you're making. It needs to have wow factor, it needs to have suspense, it needs to have drama. And comedy, by the way, I think it's, it's good to have humor. Um, I have a lot of comedy when I run my games. Uh, sometimes it, there's just a, a truckload of silliness. Uh, you know, you get 8, 10, 12, 20 people together and you're going to have some degree of silliness at some point. And I like to have those moments of humor. Heck, you see them in movies like uh, the Avengers, which do that beautifully. They do it so well. Those elements of humor. Yet in the next moment, you know, they're fighting for their lives, they're fighting for your life, or fighting to save the world. Um, and that's a great example of of, of world building um, and, and starting of just that that germ of an idea. If you you know, I, I I'm 64 years old. I discovered Marvel Comics when I was like nine. Um, and so I was there from for almost the beginning when Marvel was really starting their, their, their new age of, of heroes, of Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. And, and I can tell you right now, they didn't have this huge, bold, sweeping world. Uh, it, clearly they had a certain idea of what they wanted to do and a certain heroic archetype that they stuck with for the most part. Um, and they started with these characters in the setting they knew. I mean, Marvel was, was, was in, in, in uh, New York City. And most of the artists lived in and around New York. So, surprise, surprise, where was the Fantastic Four headquarters? Manhattan. Where was Spider-Man? He lived in Queens and did a lot of his superheroing in, uh, in, in Manhattan. Um, and they started with these small characters. And then it kind of built and built and built. And there you get back to that organic. You want to have some wiggle room. You want to have the ability to expand and, you know, ride with your audience and give your audience what they want. 
Uh, and again, that involves listening, just like a game master. The best game masters are the guys who listens to his his players and then gives them the kind of adventures or, or the ex expectations that, that they're anticipating. Um, and they have a blast because that game, that adventure, uh, was was pretty much, you know, built around them. Uh, and so they have a magnificent gaming experience. Uh, same thing when you're world building or publishing source books. You listen to your audience and what they want. You know, you don't always do everything that they, that they, they ask or talk about, uh, or it may take you a while to get to it, but you, you listen to them and you try to give them what they want, especially when they have, you know, constructive criticism. Uh, you know, the day you think you've got nothing to learn is the day you turn into a hack. Um, there's always things to learn, there's always things to build upon. Um, let's see, what else we got here? Uh, how do you keep the world in canon over time? For example, a world like the Palladium Fantasy RPG it has been in development for over 35 years, so I imagine it's not easy. And how do you go about, carefully I imagine, extending, amending canon? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, I've, I've been writing most of this stuff since day one, so I don't remember what I wrote 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago. Um, so I go back and reread my stuff, and there's stuff I missed. I mean, I, I, I have, Wayne Smith is great for, for continuity. Um, you know, it's another reason to put out raw editions. Uh, raw preview editions as you get feedback from fans who something that all of us might have missed the fan says well how can this be because in sourcebook x it says this you know and i have to sit back and go well shucks <laughs> you know in, in in sourcebook x it does say this so i either need to make the new stuff conform with what it said in sourcebook x or come up with some kind of plausible explanation or reason why that no longer holds true, or perhaps never held true. Maybe it was, you know, this is what everyone believed, but, you know, it's a wilderness area, and no one really knew it was there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, again, I think it's important to keep canon, uh, some stuff canon, and certainly to keep continuity. Uh, it has to make sense. Plausibility, I think, is huge. Um, I always get a kick when... Uh, uh, a kick out of it when someone comes up to me and goes, I love your games because they're so realistic. Uh, you know, and none of them are, are, are really realistic, but the setting is plausible. It makes sense. They're willing to read it and go, wow, that works. I remember when I finished writing uh, The Magic uh, for Beyond the Supernatural in 1989, and it would also become the foundation, that magic would become the foundation for, for riffs. But when I, I showed it to one of my guys who worked for me at the time, uh, not even a writer or editor, just just uh, you know one of the office guys and a pal, Richard Burke. He, he he read it and walked up to me and he had this wonderful expression on his face, so, sort of like uh, a look of of joy and surprise, and he says, "Kev, not only is this great and it makes total sense." But if magic is real in the real world, this is how it works. <laughs> and, and that's what I wanted. Um, and again, that gets back you know, to, to world building for Beyond the Supernatural. I want a world that's entrenched in our modern world. And yet, there's this whole underbelly, this whole world of mystery and magic that people and the supernatural that people don't know about. And that boils out, you know, in the shadows and sometimes leaks into our world for better or worse. Um, so Beyond the Supernatural, more than many other games, needs to have that sense of realism, that sense of plausibility. And it's also cool because unlike Heroes Unlimited, which is your classic superhero game, or Rifts or Palladium Fantasy, with all the usual fantasy tropes and some other cool stuff, Beyond the Supernatural has built-in limitations because it's our world. So, for example, 
people who most people who play fantasy games and, and games like Rifts and other science fiction stuff, especially if you're out in like the outback, you know, or, or the outreaches of, of alien worlds, and you know, when you're Captain Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise exploring, you know, boldly exploring brave new worlds, anything goes. But within our society, you can't just go tromping around and breaking into homes because you suspect there's a vampire in the basement. There are laws, there's restrictions, there's, and I'll tell you, a lot of, a lot of players, it takes a while for them to get adjusted to beyond the supernatural because before they know it, the police are showing up and going, hey, what are you doing snooping around this person's house or, or this church or this business? And, and again, you can't say, well, I, I suspect this guy is a uh, you know, leader of a cult and they're summoning demons and they have really bad things planned for this city um, because you sound like a lunatic and you're going to get locked up. Um, you know, same thing with, you know, you can't have just monsters running around. Uh, in fact, when I, I did uh, the second edition of um, Beyond the Supernatural, my big challenge w w with magic and uh, the monsters and everything about it was how can this all be in the shadows and the world at large doesn't believe any of this stuff if some hideous creature just went tromping down Main Street, you know, slapping people and eating folks and biting off heads and, you know, Ghostbusters, you know, it's a great example. After you see that, you kind of have to believe there's ghosts, right? Uh, and ancient gods. Uh, it's hard to put that genie back in a bottle once that's released. So how do I create a setting where all these things are real, when all your favorite horror movies can be brought into play and more without being able to prove that magic's real, ghosts are real, um, demons are real in the context of the game. That, that was a real, real, real uh, challenge. But, but I, I figured it out and in fact one of the main things, uh, one of the core elements uh, and this just goes to how, how different aspects of world building manifest uh, and why it takes a long time sometimes to, to pound out a game uh, or a setting. There, there's a one-page section that talks about how psionics work in, in battling the supernatural. And, and I think it's a really clever way that it works and, and, and functions it took me two frickin' months to figure that out. You know, granted, I wasn't thinking about it every minute of the day, and I worked on other sections in between, but I spent the majority of those two months trying to figure that one page of core rules vital to the operation of, of that world setting it took me forever, and I had been percolating in, in the back of my head for for many, many months more than that before I even sat down to write it, and I just was not happy with it, and I kept pounding it out and kept rewriting the rules and playtesting them um, to make them work, and, uh, you know, all that time went into what is one stinking page in that book. But it's it's vital. It's one of the the pillars of the foundation of, of that world, and it's also the foundation for how magic will work in that world. So it needed to make sense. It needed to be fully fleshed out. Um, and, and those are just the different elements that that come into play. Uh, let me see if I can dig out some more questions here that uh, folks that I know folks want to know. Um, I think I kind of answered those. Uh, I've covered a lot of this stuff. Um, let's see. Um, so that's kind of a good question. Um, you, you know, you are you are an artist, a game designer, and, and a writer, Kevin. Which of these skills do you think has been most important for you in shaping your world 
and building the IPs. And again, I, I I don't think I could be the type of game designer I am without being an artist and a writer. Uh, and it also has to do with uh, you know building your reference library. Um, that, that's something Chuck Walton brought up to me that, that a, a famous artist keeps talking about um, is having your your library of knowledge and references. So, you know, I, I, I read so much stuff and I pulled elements from so many things. The trick, I think, is trying to keep an open mind and, and draw from your experiences and experience of others and things that you witness and say. I mean, there was a lot of times where I looked at something and said, I think that doesn't work. How would I do it differently um, uh, or, or better? Um, or that's cool. How can I bring that into a role-playing game? Uh, like people often ask me how, how I was able to run 26 people in, in a game, uh, e even if the game was eight or ten hour long uh, each game session. Um, and and the, the trick I got was from soap operas. Yeah, daytime soap operas. My mom was sick with cancer, and I would come and visit her every day. And you'd watch a couple hours there and, and talk with her and watch a couple hours of soaps with her because she was into some of these daytime soaps. And one of the things I, I learned from the soap operas is that cla classic poignant moment where this character and that character have some conflict or reach some pivotal moment where it's like, Yes, Roger, I'm burying your baby. Mm -hmm. And they switch to commercial and when they come back, it's two new characters. Well, I would do that with the game where, because when you're running 26 people, inevitably, just like at a party, people tend to splinter off into smaller groups or cliques. So you got these six guys here, these eight guys there, these four people here, and they're all doing whatever, but it all fits into the context of, of the game. And so, you know, it's like, what do I hear? And I tell them something, they're like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, Hold that thought, and I go to this, this, these guys over here, or this click over here, and say, "Okay, what are you guys doing?" And then at some, you know, appropriate moment, I say, "All right, hold that thought," and I go over here. And even if a battle or something breaks out, and then I have to pause to go over to this group to keep the whole motion going, it works out beautifully in a game because it gives these guys and those guys time to figure out what their next move is going to be. So while these guys are exploring over here and finding, you know, some deep dark mystery that may or may not have anything to do with what's happening there, that could maybe stop this fight or win the day, by the time I get to the guys locked in battle, they're ready with, okay, I'm, you know, Bob is casting this spell, Ted is doing this, Alex is doing that, you know, Eric is doing this, Mike is ready to do whatever. It just works beautifully, um, and I got that from soap operas, uh, that, that cool way of how they stop at a moment, like a little mini cliffhanger, and move on to our other characters in this much larger drama. Um, so, so yeah, be open to everything, listen to everybody, um, and, and develop ideas um, based on, uh, on everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 draw on, I draw on all of that. Uh, I think my visual uh, part of me as an artist helps because I, I picture creatures very, and world settings and, and all that, I, I picture it very, very clearly, um, although I usually let my artists kind of run with things. Um, I like to give my artists a lot of freedom when I can because it enables them to get their creative juices flowing and feel more of a contributor to, to the process and, and I want that. Um, you know and sometimes I'll even I'll give my artists like a vague idea of what I'm looking for and, and say okay each one of you guys give me three or four creatures you know based on these ideas and then I get the art back in and, and, and I mean vague ideas and then I look at the creatures, and then I, I, I build, uh, you know, um, 
that creature based on what I'm seeing because you know their interpretation might be very different than mine and uh, you know you, you tell 10 artists to draw the same vague descript described creature um, and, and you're going to get 10 different versions of things and, and some will be similar but some are going to be very different and, and that, that's, that's very cool uh, it's a nice thing to do uh, to get your juices going too um, so uh, I think we kind of talked about uh, how to develop ideas um, and we talked about where I think we touched upon where, how ideas where ideas come from I uh, like I said I get ideas from everything and, and you should too um, and, and when you're going to tackle you know, building an adventure or building a, a world or a source book, you know, start with what excites you because you ultimately are the catalyst for, for all of this. Uh, so, yeah, find what makes you excited. Find what you think will be fun. Uh, and when you can't, make that an exercise. You know, here's something that, that's kind of dull and boring. How can I make this unique? How can I make this different? Uh, I've gotten really good at that, and I've gotten to really enjoy that that challenge. Uh, and you know, of course, sometimes things can't be everything. Can't be you know the hero, the big thing. The you know some things have to be mundane. Um, but you know, when you can juice it up, you know, do it. Um, you know, that's what we did with uh, Dead Rain. Uh, it's not just, you know, the zombies. Uh, there's just different types of zombies. The way the zombies function are, are, are different. The way they hunt is different. Um, the survival elements, you know, developing the game, building your, your, your game. Um, you know, there's... You want to do different, different things. Um... Let's see, uh, how do you keep organize your notes and ideas? Block text, pictures of short notes, skinny outlines of headings, or something else? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. Mostly I like to work on my computer. Um, although if I don't have my uh, computer in front of me, um, I'll write things down on notepaper. Or sometimes I want to see it on notepaper. Uh, but as ideas come, I, I, I jot them down. Not even necessarily in an outline. That, that often comes later while I reread through them. And I go, okay, this goes with this, and this goes with that. And uh, I kind of rearrange everything. Um, and then... Uh, I just kind of build from there. Like I said, uh, depending on how inspired I am at the moment, if it's just like ideas or like I'm, if I'm talking to somebody, uh, if Alex or, or, or Chuck or Wayne or someone is in my office um, and I'm bouncing ideas off of them and they're giving me ideas, I'm, I'm taking notes on the computer um, so that I can look at them later and maybe I'll use them and maybe I won't. Um, I, uh, I've come to realize that I tend to approach my writing and world building in a similar fashion to uh, film directors. Uh, I've heard several interviews with, with film directors where they talk about how, you know, where did this idea come from? And it, sometimes they, they, they come from the strangest places. And I've heard directors say he doesn't care if the idea comes from the lighting guy or the guy sweeping the floor or, you know, the craft food person uh, or the actor or an exec or whoever. If it's a great idea, he's going to try to find a way to put it into his movie, um, even if it means retooling uh, what he originally had in mind or throwing out his own idea, his own vision. Uh, I do that all the time. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. For me, it's about the end product. It's not about my ego. I mean, for God's sake, I've, I've written gazillions of books, you know, a couple hundred or more. You know, I, I don't need a book to be all mine. It, it doesn't need to be my idea, my idea only. That's stupid. 
um, if someone gives you a great idea and you need to run with it, um, you know, that might slow things down sometimes. And it has where, you know, I'm working on stuff and I may have written a whole, you know, quarter or third of the book and then someone comes up with a better idea or I come up with a better idea and I'm like, no, oh, why didn't I have this sooner? But I didn't and it came now and I'm going to run with it because it makes the end product that much better. Because uh, it's all about the fun, it's all about the usability, it's all about the entertainment, uh, it's all about the wow factor. Um, you know, I once, once had someone say, uh, well, you know, if I write an average game and the writing's average and the art's average and everything's average, you know, shouldn't that sell well average? And the answer is no. Uh, I mean, think about it. When was the last time you said, Jason, you gotta go see this movie. It is so average. No. You say, holy crap, this movie or this TV show or this book, it blew my mind. Or there's a scene in there or a special effect or a character or the twist at the end. That's what you get excited about. You get excited by things that surprise you, uh, that you're not expecting, um, that takes a, an old idea and puts a spin on it, that takes you on, on a, a ride that you think you know on and suddenly, you know, there's a twist that takes you into areas that you, you never expected. Um, things that are just thrilling and exciting. Uh, a great example of that in his role playing is when you roll a natural 20. I mean, I've had, depending on the situation and the intensity of the moment, the drama of the moment, you know, someone rolls a natural 20 for a kill shot and the whole frickin' group erupts in cheering. I mean, it's a stupid game, right? But everyone is on their feet going, yeah, you did it! Awesome! And that's what makes role-playing games awesome. And so when I'm designing my worlds and I'm writing my, my source books and my, and, and my RPGs, I'm trying to find moments like that in my book that as you are reading it, you go, wow, never thought of that. Or, wow, that is cool. Or better yet, wow, I can't wait till I want to play that. Holy moly, I don't want to run into that thing. But when you do, you're excited because, holy moly, how are you going to defeat this? You guys now have to really think, and you have to work as a team, and there's, there's all those role-playing elements that come into play, and it's just exciting, you know, and, and there's nothing like it. Uh, and I think that helps me in, in writing and world-building, is I, I love the medium, I, I love what I do, I, I, I love imagining the players because I think as I mentioned earlier the gamers my audience are always with me and often specific people specific players uh, because they're sort of archetypes and uh, I know how they think and so I can sit back and go okay I think this this spell or weapon or whatever is, is really tight this new rule and I stop and think oh but how would he how would he try to mess with this, and how would he try to exploit every every ounce out of it? Um, and it helps me. It helps me as a writer. Um, and, and it also keeps my enthusiasm, because there are times when I'm writing away like a demon, and I'm thinking, oh my god, the gamers are going to love this, the players are going to shit a brick. Um, it gets me excited, because I'm thinking like you. I'm putting myself in, in your position, and I'm thinking man, I, I, I would love this or, or, or fear this or be so excited by this. And uh, I try to capture that, you know, in, in my writing and in, in what I'm doing in, in the world. Um, you want, like I said, you want to create this playground. Um, so uh, how do you improve your own creativity? That was a question from a couple people. Um, it gets back to building that, that library. Um, watch movies, watch TV shows, watch or read books, um, read comics, uh, plays, theater, uh, life plays, uh, all of that, uh, you know, real life, watch everything. And when I say watch a movie or a TV show or whatever, I don't mean just watch it or maybe, yeah, watch it 
for the enjoyment of it and then rewatch it and think about what did why did I enjoy that so much what did he do you know what did the writer or the director do or that game designer do that that got me so excited that made me go wow this is great I love this um you know it's uh I think it's a really uh, important to have a big library to draw on. Uh, and I mean that in a sense of th there were times where uh, I, I have a really fabulous writer. Uh, this guy is just, when he's on fire, there's nobody better. Not, not me, not Woodjik. Um, nobody I can think of who, who's better than this guy. The problem is his library of experience, even fanciful experience with film and, and, and books and things, um, are, are limited. So I can't say, I can't use a reference like look at The Magnificent Seven or look at Aliens, the second Alien movie, and at how beautifully James Cameron was able to give you nuanced characters that you really, if you think about it, you only see Vasquez and Hicks and these guys for a short time on screen and yet you feel like you know and you feel like you care about them. Um, you worry for them. Um, you're sad when they die. That's hard to do. That's, that's an art. Look at that, study that, figure out how he did that so you can translate that and put that into your computer game or your role-playing game or your adventure if you're a game master. How can you, you know, what are the little things, the nuances that, that really made that character stand out or shine or that you cared about him? Um, and, and all kinds of things like that. Why, you know, you don't like a particular rule. Well, why? What is it that bothers you? How can you make that better? Or, man, you love this rule or that rule. That's great. Um, why? Try to figure out why. You know, be very analytical, if you can, about um, figuring out how things work. You know, it's no different than taking apart you know, a watch or, or a vacuum cleaner and figuring out, you know, how, how it worked. I mean, I can't do that. that I'm mechanically inept. Um, but when it comes to story uh, and artwork and world building and storytelling, I figured that out pretty good. And, uh, you know, it's all about research and, and studying. Um, famous ad man um, from the 60s and 70s, uh, David Ogilvy, is uh, one of his famous quotes is, research is 90% of everything. And that was one of the other questions on here is how much research goes into one of my games. Um, and you would think it's a fantasy game or a science fiction game or a superhero game. How much research do you need? You just make it all up. Mm, maybe, but not for me. I, I researched a living heck out of it. Um, I, uh, when I did Palladium Fantasy, I, I, I read something like 200 different books on fairies and mythology and, and magic. Um, when we did Beyond the Supernatural, um, the original concept guy, Randy McCall, he read something like a thousand books, and I'm not kidding you. And he lent me and recommended a number of books. Again, I must have read easily 200 books uh, on the subject. Everything from um, megaliths and, and ancient ruins and ley lines and uh, places of power and you know stone circles like Stonehenge and the Muetta Triangle and psychic abilities, uh, magic, you know, voodoo, um, just just you know in, in, in Native American mythology, um, shamanism. This is all going into uh, you know a book, and when I say all going into the book, these I'm taking the knowledge and the ideas and the experiences of these 200 or 400 or whatever the number is books 
and I'm using them as my building box. I, they've become part of my library, my mental reference library, along with you know, the 80,000 or 100,000 comic books I've read in my lifetime and the gazillions of movies and live theater and television shows I've watched, all those experiences are in my head. I've expanded my library. That's how you can help yourself be creative. That's how you get ideas. And, and, and again, not just read them for enjoyment, but also read them for information to analyze, to think about, to say, okay, how does the Bermuda Triangle work if it was real? Let's figure that out. Uh, how do I do that in a game? And that's, that's what I've done time and time and time again. Um, you know, I draw from history. I'm a history buff, so I like all kinds of things, historical things. I love mythology because there's so much great stuff you can pull out of mythology. And, and when you start reading about all kinds of world mythology, there's all kinds of things that you just can't help noticing that, wow, vampires of some kind or another really do exist in every type of society. How can that be? Well, is that, you know, this Aboriginal people and that Aboriginal people and these guys? Why did they all have, you know, some kind of blood-sucking demon? Um, is that something born in our own psyche from how we evolved, or is that is there something to it? And of course, in the context of, of, of a role-playing game like Beyond the Supernatural, or or um, Planning in Fantasy, or even uh, Nightbane, yes, the answer is the answer is yes. And, and I'm coming up with this fictionalized you know, history or background that sounds plausible and, and that you're going to read and go, wow, that's what a cool idea. And I buy it hook, line, and sinker for this game setting in this world um, because it's cool and because it's plausible and because it's backed up by a mountain of research and, and, and things that I can draw upon. And, and that's what the, your, your library, your, your mental reference library is all about. Things that you can draw on. Things that you can say, man, I, I like that weapon in this sci-fi movie. I liked this type of magic that they came in or this visual effect. How can I kind of translate that in my mind and put it into my game um, that will be something that people will, will enjoy or, or makes my world more um, impressive and exciting. Um, so uh, I, I, I hope I hope this stuff was helpful uh, and informative, and if nothing else, fun. Um, one of the last questions I, I think is uh, is a good one: is uh, every creator has their own influences. What do you think were your influences when you created the concept of riffs? Um, I, I, that's a good question. Um, like I said, part of my, 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 my desire and orientation was to do what people said you couldn't do. Um, you know, at the time people were saying you couldn't combine magic and technology, it just didn't really work. Uh, and I said, not only am I going to combine magic and technology, I'm going to include you know, horror and the supernatural and post-apocalypse and mutant animals and everything under the sun, aliens, and uh, and I'm going to make it work and it's going to be, you know, terrific fun. Um, and again, I think a lot of that, I drew a lot on favorite movies, favorite comic books, uh, elements of so many different things, mythology, uh, and some of those are obvious in, 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 in the game and the source books. Um, it, uh, you know, it just, it just comes to me, uh, you know, and, and certain things will, will inspire you. Like, it was, it was interesting, a buddy of mine who's very astute uh, had just finished up reading some Fafford and the Grey Mauser and a bunch of Robert E. Howard, Conan, and, and other stories. And uh, he calls me up and tells me how he read a bunch of this stuff. And he goes, I now realize what inspired Palladium Fantasy. And, and he blew me away. Because if, if you read the Conan novels and stuff, and read my, my Palladium Fantasy series of books, uh, game books, um, they're, they're nothing like Conan, 
but that element, that feel, that sort of high fantasy, that sword and sorcery, uh, with little touches of humor, like the like Fafford and a gray Mauser, and, and a whole sense of adventure. The, uh, yeah, Palladium Fantasy w w was deeply affected by my love and reading of Robert E. Howard and uh, a number of other other people, um, but that was right up there. Um, you know, for me, role playing is uh, you know all about adventure. Like I said, character and story, and the adventures that they 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 go on and that they weave. Um, and Conan was always going on adventures. Comic books played a huge role in that because what I mean, there's always these adventures. Every comic book, you know, these serialized things like like TV shows. So every issue or two um, is a new adventure or a new crisis or a new villain or a new something that our hero or heroes have to deal with. That's role playing. I, I drew so much from comic books and from adventure characters and novels like 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 Tarzan and and Conan and uh, you know lots of other things so uh, th those were huge influences on me uh, especially comic books like I said um, you know at age nine I sat I came out of my bedroom and, and pronounced to my mom and dad um, that when I grew up I would be a comic book writer and artist and then marched back into my bedroom and, and went to, you know, draw my first comic book, right? Uh, which was terrible. And uh, so I, I, I lived, breathed comic books for 15 years, easy. Um, and, and continued to read them, you know, well, well into my 50s. And I still pick up the occasional comic book from time to time. I don't, I don't follow them like I used to. Um, but, uh, yeah, comic books were a huge part of my life. Stan Lee was a huge part of, you know, a huge influence on me. You know, artists like Jim Steranko and Jack Kirby and, uh, um, John Buscema and, and countless others, uh, were all an influence on me. How they told stories, uh, how they brought characters to life. Um, you know, things that I liked about their writing, things that I didn't. Chris Claremont is a great example of that. Some stuff he did wonderfully, some things he did drove me nuts, and, and I vowed never to do myself. Um, you know, and I think that kind of visualization that, that comic books and, and art brings, um, you know, watching live theater brought certain things to mind, because they, they capture that, that sense of fake realism and when you're into the story you're not thinking wow what a great prop uh, or what a, a great background painting I mean you might but you're also lost in that in that story and those characters and I would look at that and study that and figure out you know how can I draw those elements into you know my my, my gaming experiences and my world building my adventure building so uh, I think that's about it for now. I, I've rambled on for a, a while. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, hopefully next year uh, or the following year we can all get together at, a, at Gen Con for real, in, live and in person. Uh, you know, hang tough, stay frosty. Um, you know, we'll get through this coronavirus thing and everything else. It's uh, weird and scary times, but we can do it. And uh, you know, be supportive of others and, you know, use role-playing to, to escape the, the scariness and your worries whenever you can. You know, role-playing are, are, are wonderful and, uh, and I do believe therapeutic. I, I know many, many uh, military personnel play our games. We, we had uh, uh, a group of firemen in Upper Michigan who would buy our stuff. I would give them steep discounts because they said when they role played you know the, the worst part of their job was waiting waiting for the call waiting for the next fire waiting for the next emergency and by role playing they could lose themselves in that game and time would fly by instead of just sitting there wondering waiting worrying um, use that role playing is, is beautiful and, and, and it's a beautiful experience no matter what but, but it, it transcends entertainment in times like these. So lose yourself to that. 
um, you know, hang out with friends, whether it's on the phone or Skype or Zoom or Discord. Uh, use whatever means you have and uh, stay connected, stay positive, and uh, unleash those damn imaginations. Take care. Bye-bye.